Hey, welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson. And on the podcast, we talk about all things to increase performance, add more muscle, and improve better body composition with nutrition and training. All done in a flexible manner and without destroying your health in the process. Today on the podcast, I've got my good buddy, Dan Fichter. It's taken a while to schedule with him because he's an extremely busy in-demand coach and I really appreciate his time to come on here and talk more on the neurology side of training. Dan has a great background both in some very unique methods and I got to hang out with him and finally meet him in person when he was here doing a seminar. It was a few months ago now with coach Chris Corfis and coach Cal Dietz. As I've known Cal for quite some time, I've known Chris for quite some time too. So they are planning another seminar in the future, the word is. So if you can get to it, I would highly recommend that. So with Dan, we talk all about some fun stories about Louis Simmons, him going to his facility, different neurology aspects, especially related to the visual system, the vestibular system, which people generally think of that as your balance system. This is primarily controlled by the three vestibular canals in the inner ear, and then also the proprioceptive system. So how you can know where certain limbs of your body, your map of your body is in, you can differentiate potentially from neurology or the neuro aspect of movement versus the biomechanics portion of movement and different training methods. And then we also get into a little bit of cold water immersion and Dan's experiments doing that, which were quite interesting. Enjoy this podcast here with Dan Victor. Check him out at wannagetfast.org. He's got some great stuff there. And this podcast is brought to you by me, MikeTNelson.com. So go to the site. You can hop onto the newsletter. Most of the information I have that goes out now goes through the newsletter. You can get on it for free. So go to MikeTNelson.com. There'll be a way to hop on to the newsletter and enjoy all the free stuff. If you have particular questions for me, the best way to get a hold of me is through the newsletter. Just hit reply to any one of the newsletters. Most of the time they get to me. Sometimes they get a little bit, and I will do my very best to get back to you. Probably going to be better than through social media. I try to do that, but sometimes I can't get back to everyone. MikeTNelson.com. Enjoy this wide-ranging conversation. More on the neurology side with my buddy, Coach Dan Fichter. Hey, welcome back to the Flex Podcast, and we've got Dan Victor. How's it going, Dan? Busy, busy, but good. Uh, what's been keeping you busy as of late? I teach physical education. I coach indoor track. I coach football. I'm the strength and conditioning coach for the school. I have a gym that I run in my spare time. Yeah. Other than, other than that, you don't do anything. Yeah. You sit around yeah. one day, scratch I'm, your nuts, and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm very lazy by nature. I can tell you that. So when there is an opportunity to <laughs> lay on the couch, I do. Nothing. That's recovery, right? Nothing wrong with that's a little exactly, regeneration action there. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I first finally got to meet you at the seminar you guys did with Mr. Chris Corfus and Cal Dietz here. Man, it seems like it wasn't that long ago, but it's several months ago now. I know. It feels like it was yesterday. I love I hanging out with those guys. That was a fun <laughs> clinic just to, you get more stuff going after the talks are over. You get to get oh, in yeah. there and you know how it is. I've learned more from Cal and Chris and they're two of my best friends. And uh, every time we get together, we have an opportunity to learn. And uh, I love that. Love it. Yeah. And the thing I love about all three of you guys, not only are you super smart and actually apply it, you're willing to test things, which you would think is common practice. And again, it's more common practice, I think, with track coaches and things where stuff is timed, but you start getting into football and other sports that's a little bit more fuzzy. I don't know. I think it's just easier for people to be creatures of habit and just do what they've always 
done and something new comes out, they're like, ah, that's, I don't know about that. You could try to take a couple of people, scale up from there. Just you got to test things. Otherwise, you're never going to do anything new. I agree 100%. I think that's half the problem in our industry is nobody's willing to fail. Oh, How yeah. Do learn. How do you yeah. learn? You can't bandwidth of being right or wrong. Let's go. Let's make some mistakes and figure out what we did wrong to do it right. I, and I think that also comes with being older. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've made a lot of mistakes and I've corrected a lot of mistakes. But looking back, it was, it's probably the way I learned the best. Yeah. yeah. I look back to the first few clients I worked with and oh man, those poor bastards. Like, <laughs> I feel so bad for, and it's funny because one of my very first in-person clients, he came back actually now as an online client, almost 12, 13 years later, which to me is wild. So like he's seen both ends of the spectrum, like when I first started and, you know, where I'm at now too, but that's how you learn, right? Cause I'm sure you get tons of emails from yep. people. And my latest thing lately is like, how many clients do you have? And a lot of times they're like, none. I said, okay, just go get one and try some stuff with that person, whatever it is. And you'll just make faster progress because a lot of times you don't know the questions to ask, but when you have a client and you get stuck, you're like, oh, now I got a problem. I have to go figure out and someone's paying me. And so you've got right. skin in the game. And now it's much more competitive to go forward versus trying to figure out all the answers and not doing anything with them. I think part of, I talk about Chris Corfus all the time. I said, part of what we've done over the years and years that we've been training and learning and researching is we've had these stops at these incredible performance training places from the West side barbells to uh, ML SIF to you name it. We've had an opportunity to talk to those people. And I think you start to formulate your plan. The Charlie Francis is you formulate your plan and you figure out what works for you and what works in the environment you're in, the clients that you have, but all those things that you've learned are building blocks to make you make better decisions and more informed decisions as you get older in your career and you have clients that you're working with. So I love the history of how I've done it. I didn't like it while I was doing it just because it took so Sucks. long and, and it cost <laughs> a lot of money. Yep. But looking back now, I'm finally in the last few years looking back as people say, oh, you talked to that guy? I'm like, yeah, I, I did. I, I had an opportunity to sit down with that person. Like Mel Sif, I mean, he's not around mm. anymore. I I've know. had an opportunity to spend some good time with him. It was great. Didn't realize it then, but now I'm like, wow, that's pretty neat. I'd want to hear that. I'd want to hear what I have to say about that. So it's been a fun ride. And as I get a little bit older here, it's fun looking back at it. Yeah. Like the two people that come to the top of my mind that I read their stuff, knew a fair amount about them, but never got to meet them in person was Louis Simmons and Mel Sif. Yep. And yeah. was in Mel's house and Louie was in my gym. And really? I was, yeah. I always <laughs> tell the story. When I was speaking in TFC with Tony and Chris, JL was sitting at the table. JL. Oh, yeah. I know JL. <laughs> and I tell this story every time I get on a podcast. I was talking about how Louie came out to my gym and he turned red. That giant head of his turned red. <laughs> He's your lion. There's no way Louis Simmons left West Side Bypro. I've been there. I trained there. I know his every day. No way he goes anywhere. <laughs> so now I'm scrambling, trying to find pictures of him in my gym. He didn't believe, he didn't believe me until he called Chuck Vogelpohl and finally <laughs> saved my ass. But yeah, Did he Chuck came come out, out with Louis then? What's that? Did no, Chuck, come Chuck out didn't with come out. It was his okay. wife. His wife came out. Okay. Doris. Yep. Okay. And then I met him the first time I met him halfway I, in a place in, uh, Canote, Canute, Ohio. I think it's halfway between Rochester and Columbus. He picked the spot and met him and I worked on him a little bit. And it was an interesting dinner to say the least. And, uh, and then I took our doc down to Westside Barbell. He invited us down and he was a good man. You know, people look at the, his outward appearance of how rough and tumble he looked, but man, he had a big heart. He had a really big heart. He yeah. I man. think we were talking, I know of countless people who were not big names in the industry. No one would probably even know them that called up Louie and said, Hey, I want to learn from you. And Louie literally just told him, okay, just stop by the gym. And to their credit, they drove and occasions. They're like, yeah, Louie just stayed up till eight o'clock at night, telling us all about training and history and the Soviet method and whatever. And these are people that no one probably has even ever heard of. Yep. And like the same, you hear the same stories from like literally everyone who has been there. <laughs> when he called me, 
he, I'll never forget. I was working with somebody with an athlete. The phone rings and I look at, I don't know where it's Columbus, Ohio. I pick up the phone. I'm like, hello. He goes, Hey, this is Louis Simmons. I thought it was my <laughs> buddy's busting my balls. <laughs> I, so I hung up. <laughs> he, two minutes later, he called me. Now you're hanging up on me for. I'm like, who is this? I'm like, is this Dave? And then I'm thinking, my buddies don't know who Louis Simmons are. I mean, yeah. outside of the industry. So I'm like, oh my God. I, I asked him, why are you calling me? Yeah. Because I, I hear you do some really cool stuff. And I, Aww. and it was just awesome. There's a, at the time, he was 64 years old. Yeah. He's like, I, w- I want to meet you. I want you to work on me. I want you to talk to me about what you know. Like, Holy shit. That's why he's good. That's why he was mm-hmm. great. Carrie, he'd listen to anybody. And that's the same stories I heard too, is that Louis maybe didn't agree with a lot of people, but he always gave them the time of day and listened to them. Like even people who were not really accomplished anything, like he always seemed, at least my perception was that he was pretty adamant about what he found works, but yet he mm-hmm. was not closed-minded at the same time. I think the outward appearance would be that this is the only way that works. And I think he was very staunch about what works for his methods, but the people I know who talked to him said he was actually very open-minded and definitely was intent of listening and asked them intelligent questions about what was going on. Yeah. And you'd appreciate this story. And you might've heard it already. When he was up here, we were working on him and uh, he goes, for me to pay you back, he goes, let me show you some stuff. So uh, that'd be awesome. So he goes, all right, who's your best athlete in here? So I call one of our, I'll never forget it. Dom DeLucia was in there training. He was a running back at Harvard at the time. And he goes, I'm going to show you guys how to drag sleds. So we go out in the parking lot, hook up sleds to him. And Louis, let me do it. I'll show you how to do it. So he's pulling the sled and as he's walking or pulling it, he's going, this is how you do it. And I videoed him doing it. I, I go back and I'm watching the video because I can't wait to post it on anything that we have because I'm like, mm-hmm. he's our parking lot. <laughs> so as I'm watching the video, he's walking or pulling it's the same arm, same leg when he's walking. He doesn't have a normal bipedal mm-hmm. gait. It was alarming. So I'm like, Louie. This is really what you want? And he's, yes. And I'm videoing. He does it again. I bet he doesn't know he's doing it. No. I go, we have an issue. <laughs> I just figured it out. I said, come on in here. So we go inside and he's like, what, what are you doing? I made him stand against the wall and march in extreme mm. slow for two minutes. All right. So he does that. He goes, what the hell is this? I, so I showed him on the video. He didn't believe me. Yeah. He looked at, but he's a bilateral creature. That's what he did. He pow- He just squatted and he benched. Yeah. So I, that was his exercise when he went back to his gym. He called me a couple of weeks later and he goes, you're not going to believe this shit. I put 20 pounds on my bench press. I'm like, yeah. oh, I, I don't give a shit, but that's awesome. Yeah. Louis. Great. Yeah. It's like, I think it's your stupid exercise. I like, <laughs> okay, whatever. But it was um, remarkable. And I've been showing that video clip of him doing that. And people don't realize that's the unintended consequences sometimes of lifting weights in that world. Do you have early videos of him doing it? Do you know if it was the way he always was or if it changed to be that way over time? I think all I can tell you is the video that I have, he was doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I asked him to do it again and he did it the same way. So I would imagine that's the way he was doing it. Now it could have changed. Maybe his injury or those extreme motor patterns pushed him into that, that deficit and gait, but it it was eye opening, and he had no idea, no idea. So Matt, when he started Mm -hmm. to march on the wall, he was lifting the same arm, same leg. I go, Louis. Yeah. Stop it. He's like, stop what? What are you talking about? I'm like, <laughs> same arm. Okay, okay. But he had to really think about it. It wasn't reflexive anymore. So to me, that that type of lifting deadens your nervous system. It shuts down your natural bipedal locomotion tendencies. Yeah. And then you have the confounding factor of people like myself and other people who don't have some of those inherent patterns that you're paradoxically, no matter how much you suck, drawn to bilateral stuff I can hold on to and move because for my case, catching a ball, all that stuff, especially early on was almost impossible. But if I hold on to something, I'm only using proprioception and I feel more secure, like I can do something at that point. Yep, so yep. You kind of have this convergence of these people being attracted to that. And then you've got the thing probably making the deficit that they have worse at the same yeah, time. That's interesting that you say this. You were finding ways to create stability for yourself 
Oh, 100 percent. Reduce the threat, basically. I, that's, yeah. To me, that's all training is. Can you find ways to reduce threat and move without compensatory pattern? It's, that's it. There's nothing more than that. Explain that a little bit more if that's a new statement for people listening in. Yeah. So every, like, for people who follow me, I talk about neurology all the time and how it's, it, but that's movement. So movement is brain generated. It, there's nothing else other than that. That's a, from a bone structure standpoint and a muscular standpoint, everything is controlled by the brain. So most people are practicing neurology. They just have no idea what they're doing, right? So I believe that the brain has these perceived threats and Sean Sherman in his square one system. I don't know if you've heard of Sean, right? Mm -hmm. He talks about this all the time that each step that you take, there's going to be a perceived threat by a joint intolerant of load. So it's going to have a pattern associated with that. If you find that pattern and you correct it, you'll move, call it cleaner. You're not going to ever move without a compensatory. I'm always going to be there. We're not perfect, but. You're going to move in a freer way. You're going to be Marfluid. stronger. Yeah. You're going to move in a way that your muscles were designed. To me, getting strong is, it's easy. Being able to move fluidly is tough. So if you start to understand movement and gait, and that's what we're hardwired for, I think training takes a, a completely different look, to be honest with you. And especially for training athletes where you have a ramification to making their movement patterns worse, right? If you're a power lifter, you could probably get by and sure. may not be the most effective way to do it, but you're looking at output on a bar and a bilateral exercise, a squat bench deadlift. Yep. But if you're an athlete, like we've all seen examples of athletes that have worked with whoever coach and they brag about, oh, look, they've added 200 pounds to their squat, but yet their next season sometimes was worse. And again, you've got right. complicated things if you're looking at football and hockey and everything else. But a lot of times I think the assumption is if they just get stronger, they'll be better. That's true if they're very weak. But at some point, if you get stronger, your squat goes from 315 to 475, but you move worse, you probably became a worse athlete, not a better athlete. That's exactly right. We spend the world of training in the voluntary movement aspect. We spend very little time in the reflexive part, which is more important in sport, in gait, in movement than anything. Training things like the vestibular system, the visual system, the proprioceptive system, how they all integrate together. I think that's where, if we're movement coaches, I think that's where we got to be. And I'm not saying we don't, some people have taken mm -hmm. the squat and got it. I don't do that. We squat and we bench. We do all those things. But we also understand the consequences that come along with it, right? So we have to be able to train around those things, through those things, and with those things to be able to become better movers. Or else, just like you said, your bench press will go up 200 pounds, but how's that going to help you be a better football player? I, and I think that's where all these systems like RPR, all these systems that are identifying different sensory inputs are coming to light now and people think is unbelievable. And it is. Yeah, I'm always amazed. I think it was my buddy Adam from the Kerrig Institute who said this once that if you think about pure sensory information from movement, that movement in general would be expected to be incredibly painful. But yes. the brain has an inhibitory effect and it knows it's quote unquote in a safe environment. So the highest level movement is also unconscious and has very little feedback associated with it because those inhibitory circuits are actually running a fair amount. So good movement in general isn't very painful, where if you have something that goes wrong, your threat gets elevated, now your brain starts interpreting those nociceptive threat signals as painful that, oh, we might potentially damage the system, so let's start shutting this output down. Right. Now imagine if we can harness what you just said and increase performance by utilizing that part of the PMRF that you're talking about, that part of the reticular formation that is sending those pain inhibitory signals. That's a way to pinpoint where to start with an injured athlete or an athlete that's showing signs of a cerebellar deficit or a vestibular deficit in their gait pattern. We're so driven biomechanically by, oh, this foot's turned in or this foot's turned out. That might not even be a biomechanical issue. That could be neural 
problem. And so how would you start to do that then? If you've got someone who, let's say you do a lift, their gait gets worse, right? So you're using gait as a rough way to equate the lift. I did this yep. early on after doing some Z Health stuff where yep. in a commercial gym, I would just tell clients, they thought I was some weirdo that made them drink water <laughs> all the time and would provide right. them water. Because I'd send them to the water fountain, I'd watch them walk in between stuff because I didn't want them to know what I was doing. And a lot of times they come back and they're like, oh, are you going to do more bench press? I'm like, no, let's go do this over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think training is just merging that data and figuring out how they're moving, how they're completing the tasks that you're giving them and what the patterns associated with that might be on a neurological standpoint. If they're having problems, let's just take the squat because everybody talks about the squat. If they're having some type of issue in the squat, how do we know that it, people, oh, it's a hip impingement or they don't have that? What happens if a, it's a saccule problem in the vestibular system, right? And the translate, going up and down is a bother to them. Have we ever evaluated that? When we're going up and down quickly and focus on an object, can we actually see that object or is it getting blurry? Being able to look at things that way instead of just the biomechanical, oh, we're going to lift your heels or we're going to, turn one foot out and we're going to try to buy that range of motion. Let's see how we work from a neuromechanical lens. So how would you differentiate then? And again, I got this from my buddy, Adam, again, who teaches the pain reset course for the Kerrigan Institute, which I'm biased and towards, I've, but I've taken that too. That's it. fantastic. Yeah. Shout out to Adam Klotzik. He's awesome. Oh yeah. Uh, it's a neurobiomechanical model, right? Cause you've got these two worlds of, you got all the neurology people over here not all of them, but some of them are like, oh, it's only neurology. And you've got the biomechanics people that are like, it's only the tissue and all the other structures. And what you're saying is it's both, right? And I think the Absolutely. default is that we're always taught, and I know I was taught this for years, it has to be just the biomechanics. Oh, their Achilles are short or their hip is impinged or uh, acetabular, blah, blah, blah. So do right. this and move that. And I agree with what you're saying is that maybe that's not it at all. Like maybe there's a neurologic thing going on that's driving them to move that way. So how would you differentiate those two to try to pull them apart? I think you have to test it because if you don't test it, you don't know. And everybody, it's funny. I've got this reputation where if I, I give this neat exercise to somebody and all of a sudden they're out of pain. Yeah. You know, many, you know how many times I've given a neat exercise and somebody goes, it still hurts. Oh yeah. So I have to go to Try another. something else. Tool. Cool. Absolutely. So now as you do that a hundred times, your process of, oh, that didn't work. I know right where to go now. Yeah. So you develop these tools for your toolbox that some are neurologically based and some are biomechanically based. I don't like corrective exercises, but some of them work, but a lot of them don't work because it's a neurologically driven issue and you ain't changing it if it's that. So I think like you mentioned, go get a drink of water, watching gate. I think it's a window into somebody's brain. I really do that in the eyes tell the story of what's going on in your brain. And I think on a performance standpoint, I don't think anybody's taken it into, I think you can hit home runs with neurology because I come from a biomechanical background. So now seeing this, I'm like, oh, cow, there's a whole <laughs> different world out there. And there's a lot of smart dudes. Professor Carrick, he talks, it's like he's speaking Latin. Oh, it's yeah. ridiculous. And even at, those guys are at a different level. I just am lucky that I'm involved with some athletes that you can get some profound changes pretty quickly when you're working with the inputs. So if someone comes in and let's say they're a high school athlete, what are some of the things you would look at? Because you, we can make an argument that some of the elite, elite level athletes I've tested, one of them was that you probably know Jim, Jim Snyder. He had one of the top NHL guys at the time who was number one in the NHL for deflecting pucks from midair into the net. This yeah. guy was insane. Like we tried to find any errors in his systems and we're both watching, we're doing all these eye yep. stuff and vestibular stuff. And we saw his eyes kind of skip once. And then I went back to do that same movement again. And he had already corrected for it completely unconscious. I looked at Jim who was standing behind me and I'm like, did you see that? He's like, yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. So I think some of the elite level athletes are doing a lot of it correct, but some newer athletes, how would you screen them or look at them or what are things like they walk into your facility? Like what would you do with them? 
just said it, they walk into the facility. So as soon as somebody walks in and it's usually a dad walking in with his son, I'm watching them walk in. That's yeah. part of the evaluation process. When we practice football and I'm watching my guys run, I'm looking at, we got to add this, or we got to add that, or we need to do this. So our training becomes very, it's, it's funny because when you see it, one day it looks like one program, the next day it looks like mm. another program. And I'm attacking what I see each day because each day your neurology changes subtle. It'll change. And like the great ones will correct themselves. Are we dealing with a cerebellar based issue? Are we dealing with a vestibular based issue, a visual issue? The guy out of Cincinnati, Clark, is that his Joe name? Clark. Oh, yeah. awesome dude. How about that guy with peripheral and, and yeah. convergence and even Matt Bolle, who te teaches the posturology course, he talks about the convergence of the eyes and Dr. Clark talks about periphery, right? So two brilliant guys talking about it, both talking about getting better, but Matt's, we need to be able to converge here all the way, not where people think they just read from. So that's been awesome to hear that side of his journey with Dr. Brico. And then you hear Clark talk about the peripheral and concussions. And so you, it's a huge part of, it has to be a huge part of your training. If you, people who've never heard neurology, heard a Dr. Clark speak, they'd be like, what am I missing? Yeah. Why am I, <laughs> oh my gosh. So I kind of feel like I'm the bridge there. Like I'm a person who's not very smart, but I've listened to a lot of smart people talk about it and I patched it together to, to figure out a way to do it. But how I think about it, if you. So I look at principles, right? So if you look at the body and like you were saying, it's mainly driven by threat. So if we want to reduce threat, we can increase performance. And if your eyes can't converge and you've got an object coming towards your face, that's probably going to be pretty threatening, right? Because you're not going to know exactly where that thing is in space. Consequently, if you're a football player and you've got stuff going around in the periphery and you've got humans running at mass speed from quote, your blind side or right out of your vision, you could then also argue the same thing, that peripheral vision there is going to be prevent incredibly important concussion. to prevent yep. you from concussion or to just do those slight movements at the last minute to try to reduce the amount of force. So I think even though they're looking at it from different areas, to me, they're addressing almost the same issue with two different things. 100%. But if you've never had the opportunity to listen to both of them talk about it, You'd be like, wow, that, I just missed a lot. But there's a whole system based off convergence. There's a whole system based off your periphery. So that's why I tell people, don't get married to a system. Don't get married to it. There, there's so much out there that you close yourself off to when you say, nope, this is the end all be all. There isn't an end all be all. We know nothing. <laughs> but like when you were talking about convergence, three and four, cranial nerve three and four, you might have a flexor tone issue. Forget the ability to convert. You might have a flexor tone issue. Yeah. Again, that's in a whole nother rabbit hole to go down. Our people need to start talking about muscle tone, not just being able to stretch muscles or this muscle's hurt. What's the tone of your muscle based off of your brainstem? When you can start regulating things like that or giving yourself a little bit more on one end than the other from flexor extensor, you can start to really change the way people move. So would you be looking at, or one thing I do is look at reoccurring patterns, especially let's just say your right trap is tight all the time and you were doing a squat exercise. Like that to me sounds a little bit more precarious than if you were doing a clean pull. I'm doing an exercise where that muscle's not directly targeted versus I am targeting it. Or I also look at left side versus right side. Oh yeah, my right trap is always tight. My left one isn't and look at their sport and other things like that. But I try to look at what are the reoccurring patterns and then does that match to the movements they're doing? If it doesn't, now I'm trying to think it's more on the neurology side, some type of weird compensation that's going on that keeps that their body has to feel safe in that position for some reason that's driving them that direction. And that's the magic behind it. And you need to know what you're looking at. Right. So right. If I got right trap pain. Oh, but my right knee, it was two weeks ago was my right knee. And then it was my right ankle. Oh, you got all right side pain. I mean, yeah. that's a PMRF issue. That's something going on. Anytime there's pain, it's a PMRF issue. But now you start to 
zero in on what system you are going to attack. And then again, if you're wrong, it's okay. You didn't hurt anybody. Moving on to the next thing. But absolutely, you know, right trap pain when you're squatting, that is bizarre. It's a compensation, <laughs> right? Something's yeah. happening. Something's getting twisted. We do these things in posturology where, you know, you he, Matt is great with this. And it was Dr. Brico who created it. They do a modified Romberg's test. I think I showed it at the clinic mm -hmm. where if you're getting this type of action going opposite, it's a coordination thing. If you are getting this type of action together, it's an eye issue. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, you can start to zero in on what sensory inputs are clouded and where you might want to start working to get a result. So we'll do that in our weight. We'll take a pre-test before the kids come in and we'll say, okay, if you have this type of issue, this is what we're going to do today. Because I'm not good enough to make it, can't take each kid and do yeah. you know, exactly what they need. So we'll group them all. They'll test themselves. What'd you have? I had this coach. I had this coach. I had this coach. Okay, here's what we're doing. Here's your answer today for that deficit. And can you explain the test for people who are not familiar with it? Yeah, Ron Berg's test, they're just standing with their feet together. They're going to hold their fingers out directly in front of them. And you are going to stand in front of them and put, I don't know if they can, oh boy, now I'm starting to move funny. Ooh, that was Which weird. Is, I got my. There, there's two of you. No, there's three of you. <laughs> And my fingers are going back and forth. I look like I'm dancing. Oh, yeah, that was a visual issue. Of itself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be standing like this. My hands are firmly against my chest, creating stability. And I'm going to hold my fingers right here. You're going to put your fingers out towards me. Close your eyes. So they should be matched on my fingers. So close your eyes. And here we go. Are we swaying body-wise where there could be a vestibular issue? Are we turning when the eyes are closed and we're pushing a certain way with our eyes? Are we moving different ways in a coordination issue? So each one of those results will give me an idea of where to go with a neurological-based intervention. Yeah, how I explain to clients is, imagine you've got a race car and you've got like the front suspension arm kind of bent or you've got a delay in your steering wheel if you have a really good driver you can make up for those deficits but they're always doing these, tugging these at it tugging yep. and they're doing these corrections all the time versus if you give them a better car that doesn't have those weird things in it they're going to be able to drive better like your performance is going to be better that doesn't mean that you can't hit higher levels of performance with compensations going on but if you remove them from the system, you can get to the next level even faster. I agree with that 100%. But I would like to add that when you start to change that car, sometimes it drives slower. Yes. Sometimes it Oh, you it can does. screw it up too. Oh, it drives slower because you've never moved like that before. So you're like, whoa, so the that's a threat to the brain. It's a new path. It's a new yeah, neural pathway, right? Yeah. But so sometimes it looks like, ooh, I was stronger. Ooh, I ran faster. And then... Over time, it goes backwards a little bit before it can ultimately go beyond it where it's ever been. And from a biomechanical standpoint, sometimes that happens. I fix people's bench presses where I go, this is the position you need to be in. And they're 50 pounds weaker. Mm -hmm. And they're going, that's terrible. And just stay with it, train with it, and see what happens. And then all of a sudden, they're 50 pounds stronger than they ever were. Yeah. It's sometimes I mean, I've had that, yeah. that experience too, doing some medical neurology work with Dr. Shmo here in the Twin Cities. Yes. I've done several sessions with him, did the whole one week intensive and not all the time, but even after some of the single office visits, it's a weird sensation to feel that if you were judging all my motor outputs in strength and coordination, you'd be like, what did he do? He screwed you up. But at the <laughs> same time, when you've done stuff long enough, like it felt better, even though the output wasn't there, if that makes sense. So I, I, it certainly I knew I was going in the right direction and it was just like your brain got scrambled into the better direction but you just feel like like a baby deer trying to walk around again for yep. a little while you're not really sure what's going on it feels better you know you're going in the right direction but your output is depressed for a period of time absolutely you're grooving your path it's a new path yeah yeah I think that's well said. It, and that happens. It doesn't happen a ton, but it does yeah. happen. Or you're fatiguing, you're fueled out because of the stress you're putting on your eyes, the stress you're putting that on can your definitely happen. 
I can't tell you how many times we have some of our kids do eye exercises and holy shit, they, you're like, whoa, what's the matter? Oh, gosh, I got nothing. It's exceeded the limit. It's time to go home. Yeah. The first time I ran into that was years ago, I did some training through Dr. Cobb at Z Health and did the rest phase, which was their sports vision phase. Yep. And I have a bright red eye that's up and out. It's vertical and horizontal deviation. So I currently don't see real well in 3D because the images go to the back of the brain. They're split. And you so have an I'll, exo, you have an esophoria? Or an... Yeah, I have both actually. And so the images are too far apart. So when I was a kid, I saw in double vision all the time. And the brain solution is to suppress one of the images so that yep. you drop from binocular to monocular. Correct. So, so can, convergence exercises, you can't do. I can do them now, but I couldn't right. before. Okay. Yeah, right. I couldn't do anything before. But the funny part is, I didn't, at the time, when I was 24, 25 at the time, I didn't know any of this because I'd gone to the doctor, blah, 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 learned to drive, scared the piss out of my parents, just thought I sucked yep. playing balls. I thought it was normal for kids to be a horrible athlete and just balls hit him in the face. Like, I just thought, eh, some kids suck. That's just what happens. So I go to the training and they start testing different aspects of visual stuff. And then everyone's like, whoa, check this guy's stuff out. It's so crazy. So everyone in the class is coming over testing me because I've got all these like crazy ass responses. And by day two, I remember walking in, I slept 12 hours at night, got like the biggest coffee I could find, drank that. I could have taken a nap in the corner. Like I was, I don't know, Fried. CNS fatigue is the word Fried. for it. But like you just feel toasted. You don't have muscle soreness. You have no joint soreness. You just feel like you got hit by a Mack truck. Yep. And it's a weird, it's a weird sensation. <laughs> yep. Did you have Dr. Cobb work on you? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And he was like, oh. And then he starts asking me questions. You know, what was growing up? What was going on? I said, oh, when I was a kid, I had a lazy eye. I had a strabismus. He's oh, okay. And that's when I realized, and I go home, I tell my parents this. My parents are like, oh, yeah, we brought you to the eye doctor when you were four. And they had this little dog at the end. And then they hold it up and they go, how many of these do you see? Right, I guess I told my parents, see. two, but only one of them's real. Because when you interact with your environment, your brain learns what's a real image and what's a false image. So for a while, I saw double vision, but I knew what was a real versus a false image. What's and that shortly after that, called? I just had a suppression of it. What's that test called? Like a Brock string or that kind of no, stuff? No, it's not the Brock string. It's to test to see if you have binocular vision. Oh, uh, it's got the pictures on there that if you see them, you're seeing in 3D. Not, yeah. Oh, shit. What is it called? You'll think of it. Yeah, there's some like stuff. A with Lang like a, test. The Lang test. Yeah. That, there's that's some what stuff with that with lines and stuff. And the Lang test. It's got the animals, the house, and, the, and you got to do you see these three things? No, I don't see any of them. Okay. You need yeah. to put the optometrist. Yeah. And the, the short version is they just patched, quote unquote, the good eye, made my lazy eye work. And then my eyes tracked normal. And they said, oh, you're good. And I went back to my optometrist, like when I'm 25, I'd done the Z-Hell training. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm like, how did you test to see if I can see in binocular vision all the time? Right. He's like, yeah. I'm like, there's no way I could have passed any of those tests. He's like, no, you failed them every time. And I said, <laughs> yeah. And why did you tell me about this? He's like, I don't know. Did you want to work on it? I said, yeah, but I probably need to find a behavioral optometrist, or this is before I learned about right. you know, functional neurology. And he's like, oh, I'm a behavioral optometrist. And I'm like, you are? I said, why did fired. you never mention this? And so he's like, make another appointment, come back, we'll try some stuff. I'm like, okay. And so he just puts you in front of a computer and has you like line up these images and then uses like up to a 10 degree prism to try to yep. just move the visual image. And I couldn't do that at all. And he's just, ah, I don't know what to do with you. It's so bad. We can't do anything. And I said, what should I do? He's like, I can get a surgery consult. I'm like, okay. So you could maybe pull the muscles to have my eyes aligned, but that doesn't mean my brain is going to take the image, does it? He's maybe. And I'm like, what's, what's the percentage that this is effective? He's maybe 20 to 30%. I'm like, that sounds horrible. Like you gave me a referral for something that might be 20% that's a surgical procedure. So I was not happy with it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm paying you? Holy. Yeah. God. And I'm paying you. Wow. Yeah. That was pretty wild. Wow. Um, so one of the things I even do now with clients is on my little intake form, it's, do you play ball sports? Like, and even I've had in my living room, just take a ball, yep. put little letters on it and throw it so it doesn't spin. 
and be like, okay, catch the ball, track it into your hand and tell me the letter or the number. Yep. You'd be amazed like how many adults have a very difficult time doing that, like more yeah. than you would think. Have you heard that program, Bala Vista? Ball, I have not. It's a ball balance, visual, whatever, but it's the guy created this whole curriculum around bouncing balls, catching them, hand eye hmm. coordination. It's fantastic. It's Bella, B A L V I S, Bella Vists. Okay. I'll have well, to check that out. Yeah, look it up. He's, he, it's crazy, but I've used a lot of that stuff with some of our, we do it in our individual practices for some of our wide receivers. Mm. Take tennis balls and we're constantly catching, rotate. So the one time on Monday Night Football, one guy was doing that, and my kids are text messaging me. Coach, we do that all the time. We've been doing that for years. I'm like, okay, guys. But yeah, from a um, standpoint of being able to just have the hand eye, qu people don't realize that gives you mobility. Oh, and yeah. brain gives you stability. So these things that we work on balance wise, hand eye coordination, foot coordination, these things are important for us to be good movers. Forget stretching your hamstrings. It's incredible. You want to increase your shoulder flexing? Learn how to juggle. Yes. Yeah. That was one of the things I ended up doing. It took me three months to teach myself how to juggle. Because I'm like, I'm yep. either going to try to figure out how to be very functional with monocular vision until I can figure out binocular, which I figured was a higher rating. But yeah, that took forever. And now it's like, I can teach most people. 30 minutes maybe yeah. if you know the system to do it shouldn't be that hard but like you said you can get a lot of mileage just from doing that especially people doing a lot of computer work their eyes just get yep. fixated in one area the whole time i gotta tell you if i'm standing all day or whatever and i have back pain i'll juggle i'll do something to get my motor coordination back and also that that tactile acuity in mm -hmm. your hands, in your feet, we have no idea sometimes that we have no sensation in any of those places, yet we want to move them. I do you do any balance work? I've got like a, a, what is it called here? A swell trainer, but it's basically mm -hmm. for a surfing. So it's a board yep. you're balancing back and forth on a little tube. Yeah. What are your thoughts on balance training? No, I would general? say I would say on solid ground and moving my head into different positions would be my balance training. Being mm -hmm. on one foot on solid ground, being able to get my head in different positions where I might not feel comfortable. I do think that stuff from a rehabilitative standpoint has some merit, but I don't normally put it in the weight room just because I'm afraid someone's going to slip and kill themselves. Yeah. Yeah. But, I don't uh, agree. Most of the literature shows that it just doesn't seem to transfer very well yeah, for yeah. strength and conditioning type purposes. Right. Now, if you're trying to get, if you're trying to, like, I love perturbation. I love hitting somebody and making them respond back and challenging them that way. I do think our eyes and our feet play more of a role in our upright posture than our vestibular system does because we're not moving at the point. I do allow with the eyes and the feet. Maybe some other examples you do with eyes and feet. It depends. So we will work convergence. We will work divergence. Like pencil push-up type stuff. Yep. We'll work saccadic movement when we're going near to far. We will do a lot of tactile stuff with the feet. A lot of stuff. Like we have those neuro spike balls. Do I have one here? Where they're, it's got the prongy ends. It's oh, hard. Nice. It's not soft. Hold okay. On. I have one in my refrigerator. <laughs> where I keep them. They have about a couple hundred of these in the gym. Oh, okay. nice. And it's really, it's hard, hmm. right? It's not one of those squishy ones you get on Amazon. And you rub a foot on there and then you rub the other foot and there's a difference to me. That's a tactile issue. We got to get on okay. that foot and we got to wake it up a little bit. So the first thing I'll do with our quarterbacks is I'll have them find out what hand is more sensitive. Mm. As they're going around. And we do it one at a time so the brain can figure out right. which one. Is. We don't do it like this. Yeah. So this is in our weight room. This, If I'm ever working with somebody, I always have one of these. Always. Yeah. And we'll do our Cal Dietz and Chris Corfus ISO foot exercises because I believe you do have to have strong feet. And we'll make sure that our feet can absorb energy. 
right? So we're constantly dropping off of things in different foot positions to make sure, because that's what we do. We fall out of the sky and we land. If we want to run fast, we ricochet off the ground. So you got to build bodies like that. I mean, good question. Why do you keep them in the fridge or the freezer? Because, oh, out the freezer. I'm sorry. Did I say fridge? Oh, freezer. But why do you keep them in the freezer? Because it makes them hard. It makes them harder. Oh, okay. <laughs> Take it, because no matter, you know, if they're out in the regular temperature, you can displace them a little bit. Okay. Like this one right now, it's frozen. I can't. It hurts like hell. It's like a starfish. Yeah, yeah. Looks like a it's sea like a starfish. Fish. Nothing like what people show me. Oh, I have one of those. Then I go, here, grab this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing what it does for shoulder health. It's incredible. Hmm. Because that tactile sensation from birth was the first thing that did this to feed yourself. Huh. So if we stimulate that, it's amazing the range of motion you get. So could you extend that to grip strength is related to shoulder range of motion then? I think it's more of a tactile than okay. it is a muscular. But okay. I'm sure there is a correlation. So I, it's I more proprioception argue. based. Yes. I, tactile I, I, I feeling would, you get yeah. from knowing where the shoulder is. And I would separate proprioception and tactile. Okay. Yeah. I would. Nice. So that'd be another reason not to wear gloves in the gym, right? Correct. <laughs> Correct. Correct. That would be one of the reasons why if you did wear gloves in the gym, one hand will be different than the other when you rub this thing. One hand will feel, oh, this hurts. This one, not so much. Because that's the compensatory pattern your brain developed. And now we got to get it back in this hand. And then you will see some type of performance increase. I'm not sure what it's going to be, but it'll be something. You'll move better. Do you extend that to, I think Adam might have talked about this in the course, map tactile feel where yeah. you'll poke someone and you'll be like, okay, now move your hand to where you think yes. I just touched you. And they're Absolutely. like, Hah. Like you're poking right. their elbow and they're like pointing to their shoulder and stuff. Yeah. To, to me, that's proprioceptive awareness, mapping your brain. Yeah. That's a big part of injuries. <laughs> Absolutely. Because yeah. I've you know, noticed that on a few people where they're like, ah, oh, my left arm is painful. And you realize it's a you have no idea where their left arm is. Right. They, they, even that amount of minimal input is their brain has no clue where that thing is. And then you have those two point discrimination tests you have. There's a lot of different things you could do with tactile stuff and vibrational sense. And, but yeah, I love playing around with balance work with stimulation going contralateral, right? So if I'm balancing on my right leg, I'm doing some type of vibrational stimulatory in my left. Because of the game pattern. Yeah. And just because all that sensory information is going to wind up in my contralateral brain, which yep. in turn reflexively fires. Yeah. The kids would be like, why am I doing this with my left hand? Just quiet and do it You're on your right leg. <laughs> you do um, a lot of demos and testing to get buy-in from your athletes or how do you get them to buy into the system? Well, I do, a, I'll do a few tests that I know will kind of look, they'll be like, what? And <laughs> then I know I got them. And then, so we'll layer it in. We do it slowly, but we stack things. And that's all we do. We just stack sensory inputs. And sometimes you hit home runs and sometimes you fall tip a few and you just move forward. It, there's no wrong. We just merge that data. And then what's happening is if something's cloudy, there's a threat there and they're going to work it out. And if you work those threats out, you're just going to be better. Gives you more options. Is there things you would stay away from just because in your experience, the potential downside may be too high compared to the upside? Or is most of the things you're doing, the downside is, yeah, it may just not really work. After going through the posturology course and hearing Matt talk about it, I'm going to spend a lot less time converging my eyes on people I don't know are binocular because that's an issue. Say that again. And, so you're going to spend less time converging on people who do not who are, have binocular? Yeah. That's an issue if you are doing that. And I don't think anybody ever talks about that. Hmm. They actually, Explain that a little bit more. I have an idea, but... I. Yeah, and this is Matt talking in class about converging the eyes. It's a, it's an awful strain on the eye. And if you are not, if you are not binocular, and if you fail that Lang test, it's not that you can get stuck in those positions, but you can really be cross and it could hurt you. And you have that's a above my pay grade thing. You got to go see an eye doctor and your eye doctor, not the regular eye doctors.
Yeah. Yeah. So in my case, doing a lot of convergence work, probably not the best idea. Yeah. Yeah. Because I I found a lot of times I can do it now, but early on, like it screwed me up. Absolutely. When I started testing visual stuff at the time, some of the systems I learned was like, ah, you can't really make anyone worse at this stuff. And I'm like, yes, you can. Oh yeah, you can. Yes, you can. I really messed myself up when I was. That, and that's, a, I had never heard that before. And I'm like, two years ago when I was talking to Matt, he said, it's a big deal. You have to know that going in. He goes, and if you look out there and all these people who are promoting it, you got to be careful. And yeah. I'm like, ooh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's kind of why I asked because over time you figure out what systems are. It's like one of the things I like about RPR in general, unless you're a complete numbnuts, you generally won't make anyone worse unless you start getting into specific eye testing and stuff. Right. You may not get a response, but it seems like the downside is rather mitigated and there's just more of a potential upside. Yeah, I've noticed with some specific visual drills, sometimes the stupid depending on what's going on with people. If you don't know what you're doing and you're not testing in a progressive manner, you may jump from here to here and that may not be good for them at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, and I've learned that through just training systems in general. Yes. I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. So really prominent power five school, kid hurts his hamstring. Get a call from their strength coach. He's got to play. All right, let me see him. Go through a whole bunch of stuff. I said, all right, here's the deal. I think I can fix him but he ain't going to play the next week. So they're like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, you ain't going to fix them. Okay. So we fix them. Get a call on, they play on Saturday. I get a call on Saturday night. Did you watch the game? I'm like, yeah, I watched the game. Did you see that kid run? I'm like, yeah, I saw him run. He goes, he hit higher on his GPS than he ever has in his life. And he's coming off a hamstring injury. I'm like, great. Where is he right now? I don't know. He's probably all partying. We just blah, blah, blah. He played the I'm not, okay, okay. So on Sunday, you better call him. He ain't getting out of bed. He's not prepared for that. We gave him what he wanted, but it wasn't what he was prepared for. And he's and Monday they call me back and they're like, Holy shit, he's a mess. We gotta <laughs> shit him out this week. I'm like I told you. He said, That's all right, we wanted him for this game. I said, Okay. And now he's gonna be out for a couple of weeks. You can expediate that, but if you're not prepared for it, that's a problem. Yeah. The one, one of the cases I think of that I did that with someone, she, I don't know how she found my name is years ago. She was the, there's two people they send to Australia for the marathon run in the Olympics. And she was one of the two people. Long story short, she had pain in her big toe where she could not roll all the way up on her big toe without just excruciating nine out of 10 pain. Yep. Her best friend had surgery, never ran competitively again. She saw everyone in her country, blah, 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 ends up at my door. And so we do a whole bunch of stuff. And I said, if you had imaging, is there anything wrong with your toe? No, imaging, everything is fine. It shouldn't be an issue. And her opposite thumb, she couldn't do this. She literally could not. I said, okay, I want you to just do this, just entertain me and do this with your thumb. And she's staring at her thumb like she's trying to burn holes in it. And she, so we had to take her other yep. hand and 20 minutes of getting her to do this with her thumb rolls all the way up on her right big toe, no pain. So I said, great. I said, you have your qualifier. It's less than 10 days. Your times with pain were good enough. So don't worry. For God's sake, don't do anything crazy. Like your gait is so much better. You could see her go all the way into hip yeah. extension. But just take it easy. You're on your taper because, again, same thing. You just activated a lot of stuff that she hasn't used. The amount of DOMS, the amount of pain, a lot of kind of that kind of stuff she could get if she goes crazy, pretty high. I said, okay, it's great. Disappears. Calls back three days later. Hey. Come see, I think I ripped my hamstrings. Like, oh my God, what happened? Yep. And she's like, I had imaging and everything is fine, but her hamstrings were just like the worst doms she's ever had. And I asked her, I said, what did you do? She said, I felt so good. I started doing hill repeats. I'm like, did your coach tell you to do hill repeats? She's like, no. I'm like, your qualifying race doesn't even have hills in it, does it? She's like, no. And she just made her hamstring so ungodly sore. I said, don't do anything. Do some regenerative type stuff. Now, luckily, she ran and qualified and ended up doing quite well. But the same thing. It's the weirdest thing 
because you know what could potentially happen. And you also know that they feel so good, they're probably going to go do some stupid shit that they right. some, shouldn't do. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. And then you, yeah, then you get to the point where in these hamstring rehab cases that you get a guy who gets up to speed and he stops real quick. Oh, I tore my hamstring again. No, you didn't. That's scar tissue. I've never mm. hit those speeds. So you've had it capped off. You finally got to that speed and you're just ripping through a little scar tissue. It could bleed out a little bit, whatever, but it ain't, it's healed. And it, that's a whole mental thing because people won't oh, get sure. to that point. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Yeah. We're going to talk about cold stuff now. Yes. Good transition. You had mentioned <laughs> you had done some crazy cold stuff. So tell us about that. I did. I'm a Dr. Jack Cruz fan. Okay. That's where I've read. That's where I've researched. So I used to live on the lake and I would go in there every morning. And I, what I did was I didn't lift for the amount of time that I was doing cold. I got ripped. Really? I mean, ripped. And over what period of time? Like you're doing this for how many days? I no, over about three, four weeks. I didn't lift. Three, four weeks. Wow. Yeah. And I got to tell you, walked right back on with a two and a quarter bench press test and was as strong, if not stronger. Huh. Yeah. So figure that one out. Now, how cold was this lake? I can imagine it's stupid cold. 48. Okay. 48. So not too bad. Cold. Not horrible. Yeah. No. And how long were you in there for? It depends. Each day was different. Some days I could stand it and I'd be in there for a while. 15, 20 minutes. Some days okay. I'm like, oh, I can't deal with it today. So I'd be in there quick in and out, but it was whole body. Was five minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. minutes. I don't think it was okay. anything less than five minutes. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I, then I would sit nice. I would do a lot of spot ice treatment where hmm. like in between our football sessions, all the coaches would be eating lunch and I'd take bags of ice out of the training room and stick them on my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you doing? But that LT, that's freezing the fat. That's what you do. I was ripped. So were you at the point where you were shivering and feeling pretty oh, miserable? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I, yeah. Cause I looked at most of the literature surprisingly for fat loss, not super impressive, but the only stuff that does show it may be possible, pretty much all the cases was horrible and the people were shivering. I do think shivering creates, I don't know if it creates muscle growth, but it certainly creates your muscles contracting as if they were being trained with no body again, off again. Yeah. It's like that oscillatory. I got to tell you, Mike, I got ripped. Hmm. I, I was ripped. It, so Dr. Jack Cruz will always say, you ever hear a polar bear, see a polar bear come out of hibernation? They're freaking jacked. Yeah, they're, same with black they bears. have no body fat. Yeah. And then they eat their berries in the summer and they get fat again. And he believes that, and I got to tell you, there's a lot of merit to it, that we're not designed to eat that kind of food based off of where we are and what's available to us. And I believe that. <laughs> so how would you change your nutrition related to what you've learned? I would eat what's available at the latitude and longitude I'm living at. Okay. So more locally and colloquial things. Yeah. So if I was going to eat fruit in the fall, it's going to be an apple. It's going to be something that I can get around here, not shipped in from Florida. So not lots of pineapples. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I love. You're in New York. Right. <laughs> There's nothing. Like, what do you eat? Weeds off the ground. It uh, was uh -huh. not on it. But. Yeah, that was his philosophy and makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I may have to try the colder stuff again. Like the coldest I've gone is right now, today it's set at 38 degrees. And I've noticed once you get below around 42, 43, and I've gone colder than that. Yep. It all just feels really stupid cold. Like if you stuck me in there and said it's 36 or it's 40 degrees, you I don't think tell. I could tell any damn difference. It's I like could between 43 and 48 though. <laughs> it's like a good glass of wine. Once you have that really good yeah. glass of wine and you have one or two of them, you're like, oh, this is really good wine. Then you have shitty wine that tastes the same. Can't tell. Yeah. But I do that. I do cold water and then I do, I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> a million dive reflex. I put my ah. face in cold water every single morning. And hope for us. Yeah. Yep. And in, 
and is a goal to get more of just the front part yeah. of the face, yep. the trigeminal nerve, that type yep. of stuff, correct? Absolutely, yep. And then I hold my breath until I feel threatened, and then that's it. Make your skin seen... look good, too. Oh, nice. There you go. I could <laughs> definitely do that. Yeah, so I do this all the time. It, it, when I am in between not wanting to run cold water on my back in the showers, I'll do that. What are your thoughts about doing that after intense exercise? I don't see that's where I don't think I don't think it speeds recovery. I just think it's better in general for your health, mm -hmm. the recovery part of it. It helps you recover from the localized inflammation that you have in your whole body, not a specific, oh, my knee is sore, so I'm going to sit in cold. I'd probably make it worse, to be honest with you. But I just think I feel the best when I'm taking cold baths, when I'm sitting in a lake, when I'm when I was in the best shape of my life, that's what I was doing. Have you noticed when your nervous system feels better, the cold is more tolerable? Oof, I'm trying to buy into that, but it's cold as shit all the time. Like when it, yeah. when that water I, hits. I and mean, once you get into it, at first, it always sucks. The first few minutes you get in, it just, it sucks. Does. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing I can, but you do get used to feeling shitty. Yes, you in do. There. But when you get out, you feel incredible, incredible. Yeah. And that's I, I, yeah. I was just going to say, I've, I've changed my morning routine right before COVID happened. I was lucky. I already had bought the freezer. I'd planned to do this for quite a while. And I figured, hey, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not traveling. I'm not teaching. Hell, I'm not even leaving my house. So I said, I'll just do my cardiovascular training. I'll do cold water immersion in the morning. Yep. Did that six days a week for, God, probably a year and a half. Started at just 50 degrees, walked my way all the way down to 42 degrees for five to eight minutes pretty easily. And body count wise, I didn't notice a huge difference per se, but I got out before I was shivering. So I didn't really push the duration that right. much. But what I found was the two things that kind of surprised me. One, like energy levels in the morning were definitely much better and more even. You felt mm -hmm. really good once you get out, epinephrine, norepinephrine, et cetera. And the other part, I thought, ah, oh, man, after doing this for most days for a year and a half, you know, adaptation, all this stuff, like get into cold water in the morning, it'll be easy. And that hesitation before you get in, like never went away. No. Like the right before you get in, there's that hardwired part of your lizard brain that's, never. you're a dumbass. What are you yeah. doing? This is right. stupid. 100%. Did you sleep better? I didn't notice a huge difference, to be honest. I was doing it primarily in the morning. I think when I'm cold adapting, I see, I think I sleep better in general, whether I'm doing it in the morning or night. Yeah. And I started, I started a couple of weeks ago doing this at night, the, this. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. I don't normally have a sleep issue, so it's hard to tell, but I do think when I was cold adapting in the lake, I slept way better, which what to me is the key to life. If you can oh sleep. yeah! If your sleep is fucked up, it's that's a yeah. problem. That's a yeah. I don't care what. It's a problem. <laughs> Last question. We'll wrap up. Okay. How close do you think humans can get to hibernation at night for better recovery and sleep? How cold can we get? Yeah. The, the colder we can get, the more towards hibernation. Our natural. That's what we do. That's what we're. That's who we are it's human we should be hibernating <laughs> so do you use any like systems to cool your mattress or anything like that or you just use cool no air i know chris and cal do um i just make it cold yeah i can't afford <laughs> that stuff but i would definitely experiment if anybody's listening to this podcast and they want to send me some stuff i'll do it i'll do anything yeah i've Played around with it and full disclosure. I don't have any disclosures with the chili pad right now. I paid for it with my own money, but they're yeah. super interesting. And they're, I have their cooler system. And most times, unless I'm cutting my calories, I can't get it cold enough. So when I first got it, I took the thing and I put it at 55 degrees. Mm -hmm. Found over time, if the room temp is below 65, I can get it cool enough where I can wake up a little bit cold. And if my calories are lower, but if my calories were higher and the room temp was above 65, I couldn't quite get it cold enough. They have a new system now. My buddy, I was talking to Andy Gelpin about this, and 
he said that, yeah, he woke up just freezing cold because they put much bigger condenser, just a bigger system yep. on it. It's over-designed. And mm -hmm. I was talking to the founders at the Neurosports Conference last weekend. And so uh -huh. I was running all my crazy hibernation ideas past them. And so they have a new AI system where they put a sensor in the bed and the sensor communicates with whatever database they use every minute. And so what it's actually doing is it's driving your temperature as low as it goes, but it's watching your heart rate, your HRV and your movement. And it's oh trying to wait gosh. until you hit deep sleep. Because the thing I was trying to do is if it's too cold, you can't go to sleep. But right. At some point, if it gets way too cold, you'll wake up from sleep. But if you can hit the point where you're already in deep sleep, you can actually drive temperature pretty low because your body has less sensation at that point. And so I was explaining this to them. They're like, yeah, that's exactly what they do. So that's, they wait for you to awesome. hit deep sleep and then they drop the temp as low as it'll go. Look at your body movement, HRV, make sure you're not stressed and they'll iterate and find that lowest point. And then the second half of the night, which is more REM sleep, they'll slowly increase the temp a little bit to allow more REM sleep, and then you can increase the temp to have you wake up in the morning. Wow. I was like, whoa, that's so cool. That is yet, cool. But... <laughs> that is cool. Holy cow. Yeah. That is cool. So I'm um, at some point I'll get one, but I'm super excited to because to me yeah. that makes sense, right? Sure because does. you want it to be cold, but if you're too cold, you wake up, you're it's a you threat. Know, uncomfortable. It's a threat. Exactly. Threat. Right. It goes back to that. If you right. can reduce that threat and if it's like being under, it's like being under anesthesia. So if yes. I can get, let's do it, get me cold. And then right before I wake up, don't they make you cold in the, when you're sitting in an operating room? Oh, the operating yeah. Times, yeah. operating rooms are always cold. Yeah. 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 Cool, man. Thank so, you so much for all your time and sharing well, you all your knowledge. Probably. I appreciate it. This has been awesome. It was. Where can was people great. find out more about you if they want to learn well, from you? Where do they go? Well, WantToGetFast.org is our website, and we started a Patreon page where I get on and I babble. Oh. I talk a little bit about what our system is, who I've learned from, why we do what we do, and it's been great. We get each month more and more people are joining, and it, it gives a chance for those people to ask questions that they see a picture on Instagram of something what we're doing, and I try to explain it. So we're going to talk a little bit about the vestibular system. I'm going to do that talk here in a little bit and just give them basic facts of what we're looking at, what we do, how we utilize it in our training. And it's been fun. That's awesome. I would highly encourage people to check that out. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got from someone was, he's like, just look for weird people who get results. I was like, <laughs> oh, because he's like, they're probably not doing the norm. And if they can demonstrate that they're getting legitimate results from it, which again, not a lot of people can, then by definition, they're doing something correct. So I always think of you and Cal and Corfus, like you're all the weird people who are getting like really cool results. So that's awesome. It's fun. And also guys like you start talking, we, you got to be willing to learn. Oh yeah. It's never. I ending. love it. Yeah. I was listening to you talk. You were on somebody's podcast or they were on, you guys were talking cold thermogenesis stuff. I don't know who that was, but that was fascinating. It's awesome. It's good stuff. Yeah. Good and stuff. it's. With physiology, like it's just never ending, right? Yeah. We're really looking at neurology, metabolism, whatever. It's I, I could spend the rest of my life trying to learn this stuff, and I'm barely know, covering Jack like this Cruz tiny starts, percent. Yeah, Jack Cruz starts talking, and my head starts going. Yeah, the, the, the <laughs> pentose phosphate pathway. The PP, he's out of his mind, but he's brilliant. He's brilliant. But I appreciate it, buddy. to separate that from what they're teaching because sometimes they might be right on track sometimes maybe not but again like we go back to testing we talked about i can yep. go back and take a concept and i can test it and see hey oh wow that was wacky but that worked or yep. i don't know about that that didn't seem to do anything and where do people find your patreon you can go right on our website and link it up to it it's and right your there. website is want to get fast w-a-n-a get fast.org want to get fast.org you got yeah. it thank you so much dan i really appreciate it this was awesome Thanks, brother thank it's you good so to much talk to you again good to see yeah. you good to... thank you so much for listening to the podcast as always really appreciate it if you are a coach and want to learn some cool methods or you're just super fascinated about this stuff check out 
Dan Victor stuff on his Patreon, as he mentioned. We'll link to his website and everything below, so you can go. Huge thanks to Dan for coming on the podcast. I know he's extremely busy, and it's always wonderful to sit down and talk shop with him, and I'm glad you guys got to listen in on this conversation and learn from him also. If you want more information from me, you can go to MikeTNelson.com and sign up to the newsletter. That's where most of my information now goes out. It is free to sign up for all the exclusive insider information. And if you have specific questions, you can just hit reply. I'll do my best to get back to you there. As always, any reviews you can leave of the podcast, even just a couple sentences, makes a huge difference. Leave us whatever stars you feel are appropriate. Again, that really helps us out. If you have someone that you think might enjoy this podcast, uh, please send it over to them. If you want to post it online, that'd be great. You can tag me also so that I can say thank you. Thanks again for listening. Really appreciate it. Thanks to Dan, as always. Make sure to check his stuff out. We'll talk to all of you next week. Oh, that number scared the pants off me. <laughs> Are you sure you didn't just forget to put them on again?